Amen. You may be seated. Good stuff. Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. Man, I'm going to tell you what, man, it was good work. I'm feeling it this morning. But, man, the men's ministry went out and uh, just worked at Vail Academy in high school and served them. And uh, so- sorry to the rest of you guys to show you up. But uh, I'm just kidding, man. Well, I get it, man. You, you, you and John, I get it. You're the muscle. I get it. We all get it. It was good, man. It was really good to be able to do that. If you guys know what I'm talking about, the men went out to uh, uh, Vail Academy in high school, the men's ministry, and served out there and moved, I don't know, 15 million pounds of rock and uh, got it done in two hours. So we rocked it out, didn't we, guys? Man, I'm looking forward to our time in God's Word together this morning as a church. We've been walking through the book of Acts together. Today we're going to be in Acts chapter 20, and we'll be finishing that chapter today. And then for a little while, we're going to be taking a break from Acts as next week we're looking to Psalm 23, focusing on Thanksgiving. Uh, Psalm 23 is an amazing passage. A lot of people have that passage memorized. Uh, People go to this text for a lot of different reasons. It's read at a lot of different occasions. But I look forward to us taking the time to see God as our shepherd, as our personal shepherd and giving him thanks for who he is. We'll take the Lord's Supper together. I just think it's going to be an encouraging time for us next week, so be here for that. And then after that, we'll be in our Christmas, our Advent Advent, Advent season. Words are hard, again, right? And we're going to be celebrating Jesus, church. We're going to be celebrating his birth and the reason why he came. And so this is a great season to invite others that are in your life who don't have a church home to come and hear of a God of, of Jesus who loves them and came for them. This morning, we are going to be in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 13. So go ahead and open your Bibles with me. We're going to dive into that in here in just a little bit. If you need a Bible, we've got some on the back table. Those are our gift to you. Our passage today is is really important, especially when we think about the local church, but also just in the life of Christians. We're going to see Paul uh, give a farewell speech to specific church leaders in that that are in from Ephesus, and he's going to uh, leave them and leave us with an important example to follow when it comes to faithful and godly leadership. Normally we would stand and read the whole text together, but because of the length of it and how it's written, we're just going to read through it as we go. But before we do, let's seek God in prayer. God, we are about to open your perfect word. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us today. We pray, God, that we would have ears that aren't just hearing, but send it to our heart to respond. God, we pray, Lord, today that you would be completely in charge. We pray, Lord, for those in our church that are leading, those that are uh, leading ministries. We pray, Lord, for um, those that are leading in their homes or maybe just even in a small group of discipling where one is pouring into another. God, we are all in positions of leadership in one way or another, of influence. God, we pray, Lord, today that we would hear from you. We would see the example and the teaching from Paul that you have in your word for us this morning. God, we pray, Lord, you be glorified in how we hear and respond today. In Jesus' name, amen. Leading up to our text today, Paul has been out on his third missionary journey. He and his team have been sharing the gospel. People have been coming to know Jesus. Churches have been planted. And Paul spends a lot of his time encouraging these new Christians and these new uh, churches. It was important to Paul to see these Christians grow in their walk with Jesus. And while Paul was traveling, he would go to some cities and he and his team were only able to be there for a short time. Maybe that's all they planned for. Maybe they got ran out of the city. But then in other cities, he was able to be there longer. And when we think about the city of Ephesus, there was a city that Paul and his team was able to spend a lot of time there. Uh, Last week, Paul was in a city called uh, Troas. I think we've got a map up here. I want you guys to be able to see this. Where'd Troas go? You see right in the middle, there's Asia. The top left-hand corner is Troas. This is his third missionary journey that he did on foot or by boat, right? Sometimes we have a hard time walking across the street to share Jesus with someone, church, okay? So, so he's gone to Ephesus. You see that in Asia. Uh, and then he goes up and he comes around and he's in, he's in Troas. He had been in Troas. And so um, Paul is making his way a few stops along the way to Jerusalem. Where'd it go? It just disappeared. I can't use that map. There we go. So uh, he's going to be heading down to Jerusalem, which is in the the far right corner here. So I want us to read these first three verses, uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 13. And Luke is the author of Acts, and he is on this journey with Paul, and here's what he writes. 
It said, we went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Asos, where we were going to take Paul on board. So they're going to pick him up there because these were his instructions, since he himself was going by land. When, when he met us at Asos, we took him on board and went on to Mytilene. Sailing from there, the next day we arrived, uh, we arrived off Chios. The following day, we crossed over to Samos, and the day after, we came to Miletus. And Paul had decided to set sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia because he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, for the day of Pentecost. So basically what we have here is a summary of Paul's travels, right? These maps are really helpful. And he's traveling. He's eventually going to get to Jerusalem. But notice in verse 15 that they're now in Miletus. And that's important as we come to our verse 17 today. It says, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus... And summoned the elders there. Paul was not able, just for time, wasn't able to go in Ephesus, but he, he loved them. And so My, uh, Miletus was really close to Ephesus. Can we see that next screen? So if you see where to go, right over here on the left side, the middle left side, you see Miletus. And then right above it is Ephesus. So he sends people up there to go and grab the elders and then to bring them down to where he's at. He wants to meet with the elders there. And this is where we begin to see Paul uh, give them, give these elders a farewell speech and leave them with an example to follow when it comes to Christian leadership. Previously, Paul had spent a lot of time in Ephesus. He shared the gospel there. Many were saved there. A church was planted there. It was growing. And Paul just cared about these people. And since they were fairly close, Paul calls on the elders of the church in Ephesus. Hey, come down to, to where I'm at. Come and be with me. So we see that he sends for and, and summons for the elders. So who are the elders? The elders are specific Christian leaders in the local church. In the New Testament, we see the word elder or bishop or overseer used interchangeably. Uh, Paul is calling these pastoral leaders. That's who they are, the elders, the overseers, to come and meet with him. So the elders, when we think about elders, elders are men called by God in the local church to teach and lead and shepherd and really pastor those in the church body. If you look ahead to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and also in Titus chapter 1, you see the biblical qualifications for an overseer, for a pastor. We see other passages in the New Testament like 1 Peter chapter 5 where Peter is writing to other elders, other shepherds and pastors, and he says to them, shepherd God's flock, overseeing them, not out of compulsion, but willingly. Multiple places in the New Testament where Paul or others are encouraging pastors and elders to lead in the right way, in a God-honoring, Christ-honoring way. But that's who Paul sends for. He's wanting to meet with these overseers, these pastors and elders one more time before he's no longer in the area. He wants to encourage them. He wants to give them an example to follow when it comes to their particular role in pastoring or shepherding in, in the church as they lead. And so what we see here, the words and examples that we see from Paul that he's given, they're specifically given to the elders, right? We want to see pastors, bishops, elders, right? We want to see them pursue these things, right? I want to pursue these things that Paul lays out here. But what we see here from Paul can be pursued and lived out by any Christian leader. Right? Even when we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and you see the qualifications, why wouldn't anybody want to pursue that? Are you with me, church? Like that life to, to live in a certain way. It's a great passage. I think this passage right here is a great passage for those who are ministry leaders in our church. It's a great passage for anyone who's leading in their home or in any kind of Christian context. It's a text that can really be applied to any type of Christian leadership. And so Paul gathers these church elders and basically gives them his farewell speech because he tells them later that he won't see them again. You ever have that conversation with someone? I remember having really the last conversation with my grandpa. My, my, my grandpa died about 2000 and 2000. He died in 2000, right? And uh, 2001. And uh, I remember sitting with him and basically having our farewell conversation. Right? Those are important conversations. I remember in the church I grew up in, Antioch Bible Baptist Church. It was planted. It was founded by Pastor Joe Krieger. And I remember, I was young, but I remember the last service, his last sermon, where he's basically preaching his farewell sermon. What we didn't know at the time is his body was just full of cancer, and he wouldn't be alive about three or four weeks later. 
But what he did in his farewell message was he was encouraging the new lead pastor and he was encouraging the church and he was challenging all of us to stay focused on Jesus and the gospel and the word of God. Farewell speeches and conversations are important. And today, as we walk through Paul's farewell to those in Ephesus, we're going to see about 10 marks of a faithful leader or really of any Christian leader. We want to be able to look at these things and say, I'm going to pursue these things as I lead. So beginning in verse 18, we see the first example that Paul leaves us when it comes to being a godly and faithful leader. Here's what it says. Paul says, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. So Paul calls these elders and he says, you all know, you've seen the example that I left when I was with you. I was with you the whole time. Paul's pointing back to a time that he was with them in Ephesus and he's saying, from the time I got there until God clearly called me to the next city, I was with you. We've been talking about a lot, a lot about that at church recently, right? We were meant to do life together, to be with each other. Paul's saying, as your leader, I was with you. He's saying, I did life with you. I prayed with you. I cried with you. I did ministry with you. I went to baseball games with you, right? I lived among you. Here's what Paul is saying to them in the example he's giving to be a faithful and godly leader. If you're leading in any aspect, you are to be with and identify with those you are leading. Be with and identify with those you are leading, right? For, for pastors or ministry leaders, it's not that you're just supposed to be on the platform and then disappear. No, you're to do life with them. Paul, when he was there leading and teaching and ministering to them, he was with them. He identified with them. I love what one commentator said as I was studying this. He says about this particular verse, he said, Paul is showing us that a shepherd, and that's what these men are, right? That a shepherd is to smell like the sheep he's leading because he's with the sheep. You can't smell like them if you're not with them, right? We're to be with people we lead, right? Share meals with them, serve with them, do ministry with them, pray together with them. Paul is telling these leaders, for these elders, you're to be involved in the lives of those you're shepherding, right? Don't get up on a high platform and then never be with the people, right? Right? Be with them. For Christian leaders, to be a faithful and godly leader, be with those you are leading. Be able to identify with them. That's a great word for all pastors, for all Christian leaders. I even think it's a a great word for parents in the home as you lead in your home. Be with and identify with those you're called to shepherd or lead. And here's the thing, church, being with them, Paul being with them, he was able to see their needs clearly. He was able to hear their questions. He's he's able to experience the highs and lows of life with them, and it makes him a better leader. It makes him a better shepherd. As a pastor, I want to follow the example of Paul here, ministry leaders of authentic life. Let's follow Paul's example. Be with your team. Be with your leaders or your, your people, those you're leading. As Christian leaders, even in the home, I would even say especially in your home, be involved with people's lives. Be with those you are leading. Paul continues in verse 18 through 19. He says, you know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time. He says, serving the Lord. I was serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and during the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. So Paul is pointing them back to the example that he left them as a leader. He says, while I was with you, I was serving the Lord. Church, I think that's an important place to just pause and think about for a second. Paul is making it clear. He was there to share the gospel with unbelievers. He was there to teach them and encourage them and to pray with them and serve with them and minister with them. He ultimately did everything. Every time he invited someone to trust in Jesus, every time he preached, every time he served, he says that I did it while I was serving the Lord. When you guys came in here today, many have already served this morning. Justin, you're drinking coffee because someone served this morning, right? You got bullets in your hand because someone greeted you this morning. We've got kids life, all these amazing kids that were just up here. People are serving this morning. When we come here and we serve, please know that when we serve one another and we serve our guests, our ultimate aim is to serve the Lord. That's it, church, right? And so Paul says, I am here with you and I served you, but my main goal was to faithfully serve the Lord. And he tells them first that he served the Lord. These are great principles here. I served the Lord with all humility. Humility is, I I, I like to think about his his posture before God. It wasn't about, Paul wasn't leading. 
and shepherding because of what he could get out of it, because of the perks. It wasn't about Paul being in the spotlight. It was to put Jesus in the spotlight. He came ready to deny himself and to glorify God. That's how we lead, church. And so he came and he led and he served the Lord humbly. And then Paul says, I serve the Lord with tears. I think this church, I think this speaks of Paul's compassion, right? He loved others. He cared for others. He often hurt for others. I would guess that Paul shed a few tears when people rejected Jesus. But he kept doing it because he was serving the Lord. He may have cried when he saw Christians make bad decisions or struggling, but he kept doing it because he was serving the Lord. I bet Paul shed tears when he had to leave those that he had been leading and serving because he loved them and cared for them. I see Paul following Jesus' example of having compassion for those he's sharing the gospel with and serving. And then he says that he served the Lord during trials. That came through the plots of the Jews. Church, we've looked a lot at Paul's trials. And if we're really honest, one of those would have caused us to say, man, I think I might bow out. Right? I'm not saying we would have. We would have been tempted to. But he says, "I, I served during those trials. I served the Lord. Paul is saying, I was with you to serve the Lord. And I served with humility, with tears. And then I think with courage, church. Paul faced rejection from the people that he loved everywhere he went. They gossiped about him. They spread lies about him. They flat out rejected him in the message of Jesus. They persecuted him. They tried to kill him. They left him for dead after stoning him. But the Lord gave him courage to keep going through the trials. I remember the famous verse in Joshua chapter 1, I think it's verse 9, where God is telling Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous in what I've called you to do, Joshua. Paul's living this out. Be strong and courageous no matter what trials you face. Be strong and courageous because I'm with you. And so for elders, Paul's example is to serve the Lord. As you lead, man, we are not to be self-serving. We're to set aside the pride. We don't lead for our glory, but for his. Serve him and serve those you lead with humility. And as a pastor, as an elder, serve him and others compassionately and serve courageously. Right? As Christian leaders, the main goal is to serve the Lord. Yeah, you're going to serve one another, but it's ultimately about serving Him. It raises the bar a little bit, doesn't it, church? And as you, as you lead, serve the Lord and serve with humility. The Bible says that we're to think of others as more important than ourselves. That's counterculture, isn't it? Right? We're to look at each other and we're to serve in that way. That's humility. That's humbly serving. Lead with compassion. Compassion is a gut-wrenching love that requires action. It requires us to do something. So lead with compassion and lead courageously, knowing that God is with you. And so that's our, our next mark of a godly and faithful leader. Serve the Lord with humility, compassion, and courage. And church, I think to do this, we need to invite the Lord to work deeply in us. God, help us lead. God, I have pride. Help me serve with humility. God, help me have compassion. God, I'm scared. God, I'm tired. Would you give me courage to continue to lead? For the third mark of a godly and faithful leader, let's look at verse 20. Paul says, remember my example. You know that I did not hesitate to proclaim anything to you that was profitable and to teach you publicly and from house to house. We continue to see with Paul and his team that they do not hesitate, church, to say what needs to be said. Other translations say they don't shrink back from teaching. They taught publicly. They taught privately. They taught in small groups and in large groups. They taught in public and they taught in homes. Paul is leading by example, reminding them that he had a mission to teach, not his opinion, but the word of God. He had, he had a responsibility to teach them how to live according to God's word, how to, how to, how to follow Jesus, how to live according to the Lord's way. He says, I'm teaching you things. I didn't hold back things that were profitable. I love 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God. Inspired by God is a phrase that means God breathed. It's hard to argue with that, isn't it? Right? All scripture is inspired by God. Let me, let me take a time out here real quick. Everything you see in here, whether you like it or not, is the word of God. Whether I like it or not is the word of God. Whether it's culturally acceptable or not is the word of God, which makes it true and right and profitable it's profitable it's good for us for teaching for reproof for correction 
Right? We need that, right? For training in righteousness. Paul is saying, pastors, elders, Christian leaders, don't hold back. Don't shy away from teaching what is profitable and good. Church, God's word is profitable. It is good for us, and it's good for us to do that. And so as you lead, teach it. Pastors, elders, Christian leaders, moms and dads, to be faithful and godly, boldly teach God's word. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, do that in the home. Teach God's word. Don't hold back. Don't let your opinions dictate what you say or teach. Don't let culture or political correctness dictate what you teach, but boldly teach the truth of God's word. Why? Because it's profitable. It's good. It's true. And it always will be. I'm going to be honest with you. You turn on the news one day and they share a definition of something. The next day it's different. Right? We're smarter than that, church, right? The word of God has ever been proven to not be true. It is 100% true. It is God-breathed. Profitable. It's good. And so, church, when you're looking for someone to pour into you and disciple you, when you're looking for a pastor, when you're looking for a godly leader, find one not who's perfect because you'll be looking forever. And you won't find one in the mirror either. Amen, church, right? But look for a leader who's faithful to boldly teach God's word. Notice what Paul says next in verse 21. He says, I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. Paul is saying, I gave witness. I told the truth. I testified about Jesus and his gospel. He's saying, I didn't just go to one group of people. I went to all groups of people. I called you to turn from your sin, to repent, and to turn to God. I called you to place your faith in Jesus, right? And so as we lead, as we teach, godly and faithful elders and leaders and and, and parents, right, are to preach Jesus. To preach means to proclaim. It means to testify, to give witness. And so it could be right here from the pulpit. I promise you, I'm going to teach Jesus, right? Our life group leaders, we're going to preach Jesus, in our, life, in, our, in our kids' life, wherever we, our youth group, we want to preach Jesus. We should be teaching and preaching Jesus in our homes. Find a way to talk about Jesus in your neighborhood, in your parks, at your workplace. This is a call to share Jesus everywhere. Paul's example is this. Faithful leaders, faithful pastors boldly teach God's word and boldly proclaim Jesus in the gospel. Here's what Paul's doing as a leader. Paul knew personally that he had been made new, he had been forgiven, he had been saved and adopted into families, God, uh, into God's family, and his example is to us, is to tell others and bring others to heaven with you. A priority of a Christian leader and of a faithful pastor will always be to teach God's word and to show God's way and to teach how to obey and apply God's word and share the gospel of Jesus. So for the first five verses, Paul is reminding them of the example that he set for them. And then he begins to tell them what's next for him. But he's still teaching and being an example. Verse 22, it said, And now I I am on my way to Jerusalem. I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are awaiting me. One of the things we must be aware of is Christ followers. This isn't just leaders. This is all of us, right? Every single one of us. We need to be aware of who or what is leading us. You can say, man, I'm my own man, I'm my own woman. No, someone is influencing you. You're being filled by something or someone, right? So who or what is filling and influencing you? Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, he says, And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by what, church? By the Spirit. Paul is saying that as Christians, we're not to be filled with and led by wine or by other worldly things, church. Here's the thing. When you're full of wine, you are led and influenced by wine. When you are filled with anger, you are led and influenced by anger. When you are full of lust, church, you are led and influenced by lust. We could keep going, right? Paul is saying, don't be filled and influenced by wine or any other worldly thing, but be filled by the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, let God fill you up and lead you. Let God fill you up and and lead you. And in our text, Paul is telling them, I'm on my way to to Jerusalem, and I'm compelled by the Spirit. It's a great word, compelled. Your translation might say you're bound by the Spirit. Here's what that word means in the Greek. It means to be bound to. 
It means to be fastened to or to tied, to be tied to something. And that's what Paul is saying. He said, I am tied to, I am connected to, I am filled by the Holy Spirit, which means wherever he leads, I am going. I can't go any other place because I'm connected to him, right? To be compelled, to be bound by, and to be tied to the Holy Spirit means that we go where he leads, Pastors, elders, ministry leaders, Christian leaders, dads, moms, grandmas, and grandpas, for us to be faithful and godly, we're to be led by the Spirit of God. Take time, right? Spend time in the Word of God. How are you going to be filled with the Holy Spirit if you're not spending time with God? Uh, Easy answer. You can't, right? Spend time in the Word. Be filled up by the Word. Spend time in prayer. Let God just, just pour into you. Be with the church body, Spend time with the Lord, worship him. And when we do that, God is pouring into us. He is filling us up and then his life begins to flow out of ours. We're being led by the spirit church. There's a a song with these lyrics back when I was a worship pastor, let you know how old I am, Justin, like where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. That's what Paul's saying. I am bound, I am compelled by the Holy Spirit. Where he goes, stays, moves, or leaves, that's what I'm doing. Notice what Paul says. He says, I am bound or compelled, or I'm led by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there in Jerusalem, except that in every town, the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. Here's a good word, church. Paul's trusting the Holy Spirit. He doesn't know everything he's going to encounter. If you've met my wife, it's a good thing, you're okay. Two weeks in a row, I'm using her as an example. She's a planner. She wants to know, like we go on a trip, she wants to know where we're going to go, what time we're leaving, what time we're going to the bathroom, when we're going to stop to get drinks or Snickers or whatever it is. Like she wants to know everything about everything. Anybody else in here like that? Okay, I was going to say, don't leave my wife hanging, okay? Because I'm not like that, right? Like, hey, let's just go, baby, right? Let's just go. Paul has no clue what he's going to encounter. He doesn't know yet the joys and the difficulties that he faced, but you know what he does is he trusts the Lord. And he's faithful to the mission Jesus has sent him on. It's been said of Paul, while others go to a new town or city, they walk around and check out the local restaurants and hotels and sceneries and events so that they know where to go. Paul goes to the local synagogue so he knows where to preach, and he checks out the local prison because that's where he's going to sleep. Right? He knows. He knows that chains and afflictions await him, but he still follows and is led by the Lord. Leaders, Christian leaders, pastors, we aren't to be led by our culture, church. We're not to be led by our feelings or by our opinions, church. We're to be led by the holy God that created you and called you to do what you're doing. Because God, right, when we're led by God... We can, we can take others there with them, right? We're leading to point people to Jesus, not to ourselves, right? If we're, not following people, if we're not following God, we can't lead people to him. Paul says in Ephesians 5, he said, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. <laughs> Jax is sitting over here like, this dude wants to be a lot like me. I haven't quite figured out why, but like he does a lot of the stuff that I do. But you know what? I better be living like Jesus so that he's imitating Christ when he imitates me. Moms and dads, are you hearing me? Leaders? Paul says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. And then in verse 24, Paul keeps going. He said, but I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course in the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Paul is showing them as elders, as pastors, Christian leaders, be led by the Spirit. And now as you shepherd or lead God's people, as you faithfully lead, you are to faithfully follow and live for Jesus. Faithfully follow Jesus, church. Faithfully live for Jesus. Author Tony Morita says, The goal of life is not to have a long life, but a full life, one lived to the glory of Christ Jesus. In this verse, Paul says, I consider myself of no value to myself. I consider my life of no value to myself, but that his purpose is to finish the course and the ministry that he received from Jesus. Church, Paul is not saying that his life has no value. That's not what he's saying. Paul knows that he's fully loved and created and valued by his creator and savior. He's saying that his ministry, that his life are God's gift to him and that God has a purpose for him. 
You know what Paul's saying? I'm determined to live that out. He makes a great statement in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, 21. He says this. Keep in mind, when Paul is writing Philippians, he's in prison. And he says, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We preach on that verse for like a month. To live is Christ. To die is gain. He wants to be in the presence of Jesus. He wants to be in heaven with Jesus. But for him to live is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about how much money he makes. It's not about the next level of job that he gets. It's living for Jesus and what God has called him to do. He wants to be with Jesus. But while he's living, he's living for Jesus. And so he says that he is living for Jesus and to live out that ministry that Jesus called him to. And he shows us how in verse 25, he said, And now I know that none of you among who I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. He's saying, I did what God called me to do. Right? I have a clear conscience. I did what Jesus sent me out to do. I declared to you not just what I wanted, not what I thought you wanted or what you needed. I declared to you the whole plan of God. Right? We have a warning in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 4 of, man, we don't just, we don't just preach and teach things that are going to tickle people's ears. There's no life transformation in that. You're just affirming the sin people want to do or whatever it is, man. He, he didn't hold back. He declared the whole plan of God. Jesus sent him out to point them to Jesus and to call others to repentance and show them how to grow in their walk with Jesus. Paul is saying, I did all of that. Right? Faithfully following Jesus and his purpose for me. Basically he's saying, man, if you rejected that, that's on you. I did what God called me to do. Church, Paul wasn't perfect, but he was faithful. That's a godly leader. He was faithful to do what Jesus called him to do. He trusted the Lord. He followed. He lived his life for, the, for Jesus. Leaders, when it, when it comes to our lives, they're not, even be, they're not even to be lived for us. They're to be lived for Christ. Faithfully following him. Again, leaders, live like Paul said. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Because when people saw Paul's life and the example he was leaving them, it pointed others to Jesus. When others see you, when others see me, they should see that we aim to follow Jesus over any other thing. When others see your life and others see your leadership, your parenting, whatever it may be, do they see him? Is your life, is my life, pointing others to Jesus? Paul's purpose and our purpose as Christ followers, as Christian leaders, as a pastor, our purpose is to give our full yes to Jesus. Not a partial yes. Not one foot in yes and the other foot in no. Like it's to give our full yes to Jesus. Be led by the Spirit, faithfully following Jesus. As we look at pastors, as we look at ministry leaders, as we look at Christian leaders, at, at kids, as you look at your mom and dad, man, leaders aren't going to be perfect. Leaders are going to let you down. But is their aim, is their purpose to be led by the Spirit of God? Is their purpose to live for Jesus? That's what it looks like to be a faithful and godly leader. Right, so Paul has given us examples to see and follow. And then as we come to verse 28, he gives instructions to hear and follow. He says to these elders, he said, Be on guard for yourselves for all the flock, and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Paul is telling these, these pastors here, he said, To remain faithful as an elder, as a leader, he says, Be on guard. Be alert, be watchful. His first instruction is to the elders, be on guard for yourselves, be on guard for your own life, church. Be on guard for your life, right? How are we gonna be looking after someone else if we're not paying attention to what's going on around us, right? To be an elder, to be a pastor or overseer is a calling from God. Paul says right here that the Holy Spirit appoints overseers to those roles, and he works within the heart of the pastor to, at the beginning of that calling to give him a desire for the task to shepherd, 
Right? We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. He works within the pastor's heart to prepare them, and he calls them to it. And then we see that God uses his church to affirm that calling. Right? We see examples of like that we, in our own study, like Paul and example. There, or Paul and example. Paul and Barnabas are examples of this. Right? They're called to be missionaries. Right? There's that calling there, but the church affirmed the calling. I'm getting deer in the headlight. Are you all with me? Right? So, so the Holy Spirit like calls us, the church affirms that calling. To be a shepherd and to be an elder or pastor in a church is never something to be taken lightly, church. To be a leader is never something to be taken lightly. And Paul says, be on guard for yourself. You know what this is? It's a call for constant, constant church self-examination. Constant self-examination. Going back to the prayer of Paul, like search me, Paul, David, search me and try me, know my heart, God. Find if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I'm gonna be honest with you. If you're a leader, if you're a Christ follower, that should be a prayer of ours on a regular basis. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3 lays out the, the qualifications in the life of a pastor. We don't have all the time to cover that. I've referred to it a few different times. You should look at that, 1 Timothy chapter 3. But Paul lays these requirements out and says, pastors, pursue these things. This is the life you should be pursuing. This is your aim. And to live this out, it takes in, 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 intentionality. And it takes us intentionally guarding our own lives. To be on alert, Paul is saying, pursue a life that glorifies the Lord. Keep alert for sin and repent of that. If you're a leader, repentance should be a, a, an hourly part of your life, church. If you're a Christ follower, repentance should be something we do on a regular basis. I don't know if I can go an hour without sin in church. Are, am I the only one? <laughs> Are you with me? Like, this should be part of it. I got two of us, all right? right? But, that's, but that should be a part of who we are. Be in the word. And church, have other godly people around you who can speak into your life and keep watch with you. I love the, the example we see of Moses in Exodus chapter 18. Moses is leading and he's doing a really good job. But Jethro, father-in-law, comes alongside and said, hey, what you're doing is not good. And I heard one commentator said it one way. He said, he said Moses' um, strength blinded him of his weakness. We need other people to see our weaknesses, even if we think we're the best leader. For all Christian leaders, this isn't just something pastors should do. This is for all of us. Be alert. Keep your eyes open. Men and women of God in here, watch out for temptations in your life. Ask others. Ask God to help you pursue a holy life. Examine your life. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, don't ever stop putting sin to death, church. Don't ever stop pursuing Christ's likeness. Here's the thing. As a pastor or for Christian leaders, our role as leaders cannot be separated from other parts of our life. If we're sinning in private, it's going to affect how we lead publicly. If you're leading how we teach, how we lead, how we parent, it's directly tied to the personal life that you live outside of leading. Be on guard. Have others who are alert with you. And then he says, be on guard for the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Elders. Shepherd, pastors, Paul is saying it's not just about teaching and preaching and vision casting and having meetings and doing events. God has called you to pastors to be a shepherd under Jesus. And Paul is saying, be on guard for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Be on guard for your church family. This is a call, like for me as a pastor, to watch over and protect the church family, right? He's the great shepherd, right? But to underneath him to be able to do that. Paul is saying Jesus purchased, e Jesus purchased each person in here. If you're saved, he has purchased each person with his own blood. He gave his life on the cross for each and every person. And so pastors, be on guard for them, shepherd them, and protect them. As we lead, let's keep our eyes on those that we're leading to help. Keep an eye on, be alert for them as well. Be on guard for those you lead. He tells us how in verse 29, specifically for them, he said, I know that after my departure, Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples, the Christ followers, into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I never stop warning each one of you with tears. Paul's given a really strong warning, church. He's talking about these savage wolves, false teachers, 
people that want to lead the church astray. They're going to try to come in and through manipulation to try to lead or maybe just straight out come out and just try to lead you astray. Pastors and leaders don't allow that. Keep wolves away. He says some within the church are going to rise up with bad intentions or with false truths. Be on guard against them. I mean, that's a job of leaders, church. And he says, this doesn't stop. Always be on alert for your life. Always be on alert for the lives of those you're shepherding or pastoring or leading. This can be applied to all of us. If you're leading in any area, be on guard for your own life. Be on guard for those you're leading. Mom and dad, be on guard for your own life. And be on guard for your children. Ministry leaders, be on guard for your own life and for those that are in your ministry. So Paul has set the example for these elders, for Christian leaders. He's given them instruction to be on guard. And now he gets back to example, verse 32. He says, and now I commit you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. And then he says in verse 33, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. Paul's about to give us simple principles of things that guide him as he leads. And he's saying, look at how I led. I led without wanting your silver or gold or anything from you. We're going to roll through these because Paul kind of rolls through them. But the example uh, is simple here. Godly leaders, avoid greed. Avoid being greedy. One of the things we know, especially for, for their day in, in those churches, when you'd have false, you know, false teachers come in, it's to pull people away, to get money from them, right? Avoid greed. Don't let your leadership position or a position of authority, right? Don't, don't take a position of authority because of what it may be in for you, like what may be in it for you, right? Don't, I'm not saying that clearly. Let me start over, right? Don't take a position of leadership because of what you may get out of it. It's not about us. It's not about what we receive. Then he says, verse 34, you yourselves know that I worked with my own hands to support myself and those who are with me. Paul wasn't afraid to work with his hands, church. He wasn't afraid of hard work. And so leaders, elders, another principle to live out is this, avoid greed and work hard. Church, here's the thing. <laughs> when you move up, when God calls you and, and puts you in a position of leadership, first of all, you got to recognize he's the one that did that. And you got to understand leadership is hard work. It doesn't just get easier. Are you with me, church? Like it doesn't get easier. It requires effort. Work hard. In verse 35, in every way I've shown you that it is necessary to help the weak by laboring like this and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus because it is more, Jesus said, is more blessed to give than to receive. And so the next leadership principle is this. Leaders, live your lives generously. Live generously. Paul wanted to work hard. Why? So that he could help the weak. Leaders, look for ways to live generously among those you're, you're working with. Look for ways to help them to come alongside others and to give of your time and your resources. Three principles, all in one note. Avoid greed, work hard, and live generously. And then Paul closes out in verse 36. And he said this. He, after he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. There were many tears shed by everyone. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Church, to lead others is to love others. The last note for today, elders, pastors, Christian leaders, moms and dads, love those you lead. You can't love those you lead, you don't need to be leading. When you are with them and you do life with them and you pour into them and you hear their life and you're shepherding, you're protecting, it's hard not to love them. They love Paul and Paul loves them. This is how it should be, church. Don't be distant and connected. Be present and love those you lead with a Christ-like love. There's a whole lot in here, church. Justin freaked out when I sent him the notes this week. He's like, we're going to be here till midnight, right? But what a great reminder and a great example from Paul on how to lead in a faithful and godly way. Know that you're not going to be perfect, but are you pursuing this? If you have someone that's leading you, Know that those leading you aren't going to be perfect. But pray for them to pursue this. I pray.